Welcome everybody to Plant the Lights Nursery and Juniper Level Botanic Garden and to our Gardening Unplugged Talks. And this morning we're going to talk about shade gardening. So why don't we walk this way and we'll, uh, we'll get started. First thing to, when we th to think about shade gardening, and obviously shade gardening appeals to a lot of people, especially in summertime when it's hot outside, because obviously the shade uh, works well to cool the climate down quite a bit. The key to understanding shade is understanding what kind of shade you have. So we break down light levels into sun, which means full sun for six hours or more, part sun, which means sun for less than six hours, but you have some full sun at some time during the day. Light shade, and light shade means you can see light penetrating the ground. You see light right here. Shade or full shade means you never see any light penetrating the ground. So the key for you is to always look up and say, all right, what kind of shade do I have? Do I have deciduous shade, which many plants grow under deciduous shade that will not grow under evergreen shade? Because evergreen shade never gives you a break. So many plants are what we call spring ephemerals, many woodland plants. They come up in February, March. They go dormant in May. So they are, grow up evolved under deciduous trees. So they get their entire life cycle in before it becomes dense shade. So a lot of those plants are summer dormant. So for example, people that grow with only natives, woodland natives, you're not going to have anything up after May because all those plants evolved in a deciduous climate, under deciduous trees. So if you want to have interest in the summertime, you have to go outside of native plants uh, that grow in deciduous forests. And a good example would be hostas, which we all know do great in shade. Hostas are not woodland plants. They are prairie plants. In the wild, they grow in grassland prairies. It just so happens that the grasses come up and flower and give them a little bit of filtered shade. And that's why we can bring them into our gardens and they don't go deciduous. Other plants that were nearby, this would be a cast iron plant. Okay, cast iron, now that's not your normal cast iron plant, but that is one. Cast iron plants are native to very deep evergreen forest in Asia. So they grow under the darkest shade imaginable. So by bringing those into the garden, you've got this interest that continues through the rest of the year. The other option is to bring plants in from sun that tolerate shade, because those are not used to going dormant uh, early in the season. So again, if you want something other than an early spring garden, you've got to expand your palate past deciduous natives that come up and grow and live their entire life cycle in two months. Those are wonderful and we love those, but there's so much more to that. So again, the key is looking at that shade and seeing how much shade you have and what causes the shade. One of the things we typically do, we watch plants and plants will tell you if you're tuned in when they're getting enough light or not getting enough light. One is the growth slows very dramatically, gets very weak, gets spindly, if supposed to flower, they stop flowering. When that happens, what you need to do as opposed to cutting trees down is limb up. So we're constantly going in and we're what we call raising the canopy because every layer of branches that you go through the light gets less and less and less. So if you've got 20 layers of branches, you can have almost no light. But by simply taking a pole saw starting at the bottom and chopping up, you actually don't lose your shade, but you're getting less branches that the shade has to move through. And the plants within a matter of a month will just accelerate back into growth. It's really quite amazing. So I encourage everyone, if you do shade gardening, get a pole saw. Uh, and I'm not talking about one of the things from the box stores. Those are absolutely worthless. Get a real one if you're going to buy one, if you can. Uh, best brand we use is a Haitai, H-A-Y-T-A-I. It's a Japanese saw. It'll telescope up to 21 feet. Uh, the typical ones go to 12 feet. And these things are well balanced. They're lightweight. They're, they're amazing machines. And they're really very easy to to cut with. Uh, if you're near power lines, I do encourage you to be very careful. You do not want to be dropping limbs anywhere near a power line. So 
So that's the key in terms of understanding trees and in terms of their light. You also understand they drink. Trees are really heavy drinkers. Uh, I've heard it measured, that most estimates claim they use about 10,000 gallons a year uh, during the growing season. That's a lot of water. If you're uh, dealing with trees, you're going to have to either have plants that are insanely drought tolerant or you're going to have to add some supplemental moisture. That's just the nature of gardening under trees. Now, if your plants went dormant in the spring and you're content with that, then you don't have to, to really worry with that. Um, and some plants obviously are more drought tolerant than others. The other key is understanding the roots. Roots of trees naturally want to go down. And yet, in so many people's gardens, they bring in, put good soil on top of the ground, and what do the tree roots do? They grow up. And that's the tree roots trying to tell you that your soil preparation underneath sucks. Because tree roots naturally, as I said, want to go down. You have to really screw things up bad for them to come up in your soil. So what they're generally missing in the soil is air, people walking too much on the soil, people driving on it, people parking on it, all kinds of things. Choke the air out of the soil. Those tree roots have to breathe. If your soil is so compacted, those tree roots will grow up instead of down. And it doesn't matter how much soil you add on top, they will grow right up in it and you will not be able to garden. So preparing underground. The other thing they have to have is moisture. If there's no moisture down below, they're going to come up to find the moisture. If there's no nutrition down below, if you have not prepared the soil below the trees, they're going to come up. They have to have nutrition. They have to eat just like we do. And if you do not prepare that soil underneath, those roots are going to go, food! And they're going to come up into your soil. So if you ever wonder why those roots are in your good soil you put on top, that's the key. So in an ideal world, you're going to prepare the soil before you plant your trees. That's ideal. Now, not everybody lives in an ideal situation. So how do you, how do you get the, the stuff to be better underneath. The key is adding compost. Compost decomposes. Mulch will also decompose. Well, mulch and compost are the same thing. It's all about time. Mulch turns into compost. Compost turns into humic, acid, humic matter, humic acid, and then it goes down in the soil, and that's where it benefits. So it's a long process. So if you can start at the end and add humic matter, that will go down into the ground much better. You can go out in the winter time, you can actually get pitchforks and go in there, just loosen up the soil, and put compost in there. That helps. Anything you can do to help. If you have special trees, you can actually go in and use tree spades. Is anyone familiar with tree spades? Tree spades are like the coolest thing ever invented. They were invented to find landmines over in Europe and Asia. So they go in basically and take high pressure air and they blow all the soil out. So, for example, they could come around this tree. Let's just say this tree was dying. They could come in and, with air, blow every bit of the soil, the compacted soil, out without disturbing the roots. Take it, mix it with compost, put it right back in, and the plant just explodes in growth. So it's one of those wonderful things we got from the military and commandeered it for a much... Uh, different use, but uh, they're incredible. Most of the tree companies now can do tree spading. So if you've got a very special tree where somebody's parked underneath and is starting to climb, absolutely consider a tree spade. Other is understanding roots of trees, which so many people do not do. So for example, and we're looking at this tree here. I come out to the outermost branches, which is here. So for the trunk from here, that's about 18 to 20 feet. The roots underneath here are support roots. They keep the plant anchored. There's not a lot of roots under there that pick up moisture or nutrition. Because if you were a tree, why would you put roots under your branches that needed moisture? That would be really dumb. Because it doesn't get much. So they put their roots start at 20 feet and go out the same distance, another 20. So when you're concerned with water and fertilizer on a tree, Start at the root zone and go out that far again. So 20 feet to the trunk, your roots are 20 feet out. 
And so many people, when they're planting, don't think about that. When we're planting a tree here, we do the soil prep all out here because that's where the roots are going to be. But people don't think. They think, oh, tree, it's got to be take care of the soil right in there. That's a great fallacy. You have to understand where those roots are going long term. And that's where your biggest competition is going to be out here, not underneath there. Because those roots are support roots. They're not the feeding roots. I'm not saying there's not some under there. Yes, there are. But your big roots are going to be out here. Those are the ones you really care about. So when you're planting, there's several different ways to, to plant trees. You can buy them bare root, which means you buy them with basically all the roots have been whacked off. And generally, that's going to be a winter thing. Uh, you can get by with that in the winter, probably not the rest of the year. Most plants now are sold containers. Uh, so when you buy a, a tree in a container, you need to be sure those roots are spread out. Typically, roots in the soil are going to rarely go less than 12 inches in the ground, almost never. So think about last time you saw a hurricane. Tree got blown over, all those roots were in a pancake. You don't see roots way down in the ground. People think tree, used to think tree roots went several feet in the ground, almost never. They're, they're all in a pancake, which is why watering is so important, which is why adding nutrition is so important, and they do get down to those roots. All right, so that's a quickie on trees. So that's the number one thing is understanding trees. So let's just walk and we'll look at some plants. So we mentioned a couple already, the cast iron plants, hostas. Hostas, for example, do not like deep shade. Again, I mentioned they were prairie plants. They tolerate shade. They're much better if they get a couple hours of morning sun. They're fantastic there. Afternoon sun, can some of them are tolerant of that. It just depends on the variety. If you actually look in our catalog, you'll see some hostas say sun to light shade. Some say part sun to light shade. Those are intentional differences. Not every single variety can tolerate full sun, but some can. But generally, sun in the morning for woodland plants is better because it's cooler. So here we're sort of on the edge. This would be a part sun light shade. So because we have some afternoon light, we're able to get some color using things like the hardy geraniums. You put those in solid light shade, you're not going to get any bloom. So it's really understanding what you've got each part of the day. So I would encourage you to go out 8 in the morning, 10 in the morning, 12, 2, 4, and see where that light is, because that really tells you where you fall in the shade, sun, light shade, part sun. Obviously, things like hellebores uh, are, are really good for, for shade. Now, now, they bloom, obviously, in February and March, but they give you great woodland interest the rest of the year. Uh, behind that is a plant called a farfugium. So these are natives. Uh, uh, these are native primarily to the seacoast. Where these grow in the wild, full sun. So because these didn't, but they're on the sea, so they get missed constantly. They grow in dry rack, rock cracks, which is absolutely where you would not think they would grow. But because they did not come up in a deciduous forest, they stay looking evergreen through the year. Uh, Shrub-wise, we're always looking for really interesting shrubs. Mahonias are really one of the stars, and Mahonias have changed a lot in the last 10 years. Prior to that, we basically had big, tall, 12 to 15 foot things that bloomed in the middle of winter, which are really cool, but there's so much more now. So as the new species have begun coming in, this is the first really named variety of the new generation of Mahonias. This is Mahonia uribracteata, terrible name, soft caress. Now, soft caress has been improved on since, and there will be some much better forms uh, coming out, but that's a mature plant. So it gives you that evergreen interest, and it fills a nice uh, mid-size in the garden. Uh, behind it, more cast iron plants. You see the variation on those. As we come, one plant that I think is really exceptional are the mayapples. If you come right over, you'll see this bold texture here, now most people know mayapples as our natives, and we do have a native mayapple, 
because that came up in a deciduous forest, that is deciduous also. By the end of May, all your native May apples are gone. They also have the pesky habit of running like crazy. Whereas the Asian ones grow in dense evergreen forest, so they don't go deciduous, and they also don't run. So the same genus, Podophyllum. Podo means hand, leaf that looks like a hand. Um, hydrangeas are fantastic in the woodland garden. They are not good full sun plants. They have to have shade, so light shade, a couple hours of morning sun are fine, but hydrangeas are a, a generally the larger leaf a plant is, the more water it needs. Hydrangeas definitely need lots of moisture. You don't want to put them in dry shade. They will be extremely unhappy there. But if you got moist shade, absolutely fantastic. A uh, little ground cover here. We always love ground covers because more ground covers means less mulch. Uh, this is a fabulous little native ground cover. This is called green and gold. Now this, despite being native, it is evergreen. So even though it's asleep now, i.e. not blooming, it gives you a wonderful uh, uh, cover for the ground. And this thing blooms, starts for us, this one in December, and blooms all the way up through May. So again, it's blooming when it has deciduous light, but it does stay evergreen. So green and gold, and there are many different forms out there, is just a super fantastic uh, evergreen ground cover. Now behind me is another one that, that we absolutely love, but you're never going to find these at a garden center. This is the genus Curcuma. It has huge leaves. These evolved. This is a native to uh, southern Asia, uh, but we found many of the forms that are winter hardy. Not the stuff you buy at the florist. Those are not hardy, but the ones we have are all hardy. The genus Curcuma is used to make something we all know and love. This is turmeric. So turmeric is actually a fantastic garden plant. You can grow your own turmeric. There are many different types. Here we'll see another one down here. But these have to have shade. You put these in the sun, they're no good. They're, they're toast. So fabulous plants. They come out of the ground with flowers that look like pink pine cones. So we really grow them for the flowers, but the foliage is, is pretty incredible. But remember, foliage does not come up till mid to late June. So that freaks people out because people think everything should be up by March. Okay, it just doesn't work that way. So you can plant, uh, you know, your spring bulbs underneath here. As soon as they go, this comes up. So you get two seasons of interest out of the same hole. So there's a lot of opportunities for that. Uh, right below me here, smaller, these are some of the many ground orchids. And ground orchids are absolutely fantastic. Some are a little harder than others. This is the genus Calanthe. If you're here in spring, these flower in mid-April, but they're also evergreen, so they look good throughout the entire season. And flowers range in yellows to whites to pinks to reds to purple. Really an amazing thing. Now, there are also lady slipper orchids, which grow well in shade. Those are a little more difficult, so if you're a beginning gardener or an intermediate gardener, start with these. Once you master those, then you can move to the, uh, the cypripediums or lady slippers. Now, one another of my favorite plants, I love the tropical look in the summer. It has sort of a cooling feel. Uh, this is the genus Hedicium or ginger lilies. Now, typically, most ginger lilies prefer some sun. There are a few species like this. This is Ellipticum. This thing, will get, this thing will be in bloom next week. It is amazing. White flowers with these bright orange stamens. It's an incredible contrast. This one requires shade. <clears throat> Anything other than shade, it's absolutely going to burn up. Uh, and this flowers now, and then it will repeat flower uh, late summer. Now behind uh, Chris over here is the palm. We don't use nearly enough palms in our woodland gardens. This is a uh, needle palm. This is a southeast native from South Carolina down through uh, Florida and Alabama. Uh, that's the hardiest of all palms. You get it established, minus 15 is not a problem. It's an incredible plant. That's pretty much mature size of what you'll get. 
As we walk through, you'll see a lot more. If you look on the far, across the far path, that other palm, that is our native sable miner, which used to be native right here where we're standing. And those typically mature at anywhere from three to five feet in height. And the, and the cool thing about the sable miners, they will grow in stand in water or grow with cactus. They will grow in full shade or full sun. It's one of the absolute most versatile native plants ever created. And I'm just absolutely shocked that more people don't grow palms. Now behind you is another plant that comes up late with these stalks that looks like a palm. And in fact, this is a love lily. This is, uh, the Latin name is Amorphophallus, which resembles a deformed part of the male anatomy. And that's the flowers, which come in early May. So the flowers come, flowers finish, and all of a sudden, mid to late June, all of a sudden you've got this patch of little palms. So, if you've never felt it, feel the leaves. I mean, feel the, uh, the it's not really a trunk. It's really more of a stalk than a, a stem. Very fleshy. And these are up from June to September. Uh, and again, give a wonderful element in that summer garden when your spring ephemerals have died down. So this whole idea of multi-planting is something we really want to promote. It's a garden that's not just one season that continues to change and continues to grow. Yes. Do they die back in the winter? Yes, in September. In the September, they die completely and to the ground. Them, they... You don't even need to cut them. They just turn to, they just, they just disappear. They oh just turn God. to mush and uh, no cleaning up required. If they, if you have a lot of flowers, you'll actually get seed set. And you'll see seed as you walk through the gardens, which are quite astonishing. They're huge stalks. Uh, this one is uh, red and uh, orange and yellow. Others are pink and blue. They're crazy colors of, uh, of stalks. So really an amazing plant. Also behind us, a really neat shrub that I should mention that I think is probably the finest shrub for any kind of shade garden are the Akubas. There's just, there's no plant better. Uh, we currently have 135 different Akubas here on property. The variation is incredible from these dwarf greens to plants that are eight to 10 foot tall, some with speckle leaves, some with edge leaves, some with yellow centered leaves. But for dry shade, there is no shrub ever existed better than Akubas. It, it's just hard to, to tell you how great they really are. Um, I have a question over here. Yes. When does this come out? Uh, this comes up in June also. Dies back. dies back in late September, early October. This will actually rebloom almost at the end of September. Uh, now, I didn't mention, uh, excuse me, right here, another great woodland plant for more of a spring interest. These are epimediums. Now, epimediums, interestingly, are first cousin to Mahonius. They're both in the same family, the Barberry family. Uh, these also, they will grow in light shade, but the majority of them are evergreen. Uh, now, if you came from up north, you grew primarily the deciduous ones because those are the most winter hardy. They just completely disappear in September. These look the same in January as they do right now. But they come to flower in some as early as mid to late February, most in the March-April time frame. Uh, epimediums are really popular right now, and actually they're, they're, a lot of them are becoming extinct in the wild because they're used medicinally. If you've ever traveled to China or visited Chinese websites, this is called horny goat weed because a farmer in China noticed many years ago that all his goats in part of his pasture were very um, amorous. And when they did the analysis, they found that epimediums have an active ingredient that caused a greatly increased blood flow to the male extremities. And so if, if anyone in here is, uses products like Extends or any of the male enhancement products, that is nothing but epimedium leaves. That's it. That's all that's in there. So this is incredibly great if maybe you have a significant other who doesn't like gardening and you want to bring them into the, the joys of gardening. Evergreen. Yeah. Yeah. Not all of them. But, but so epimediums are really quite incredible plant material. The other plant we haven't even talked about are ferns. And that's uh, probably my number one genus. You'll see things like right back here. This is actually a North Carolina native. 
This is Southern Lady Fern. It's also a European native, the same species. Uh, quite incredible. You'll see small ferns tucked in here, even smaller ferns. They're just ferns everywhere because I love ferns because texturally, I love varying textures. So we've got the bold textures of the curcumas, the hostas, the uh, may apples, the cast iron plants, and the ferns really provide a nice foil for that. So in, in, the, in the shade gardening, where you don't have as much color, that's where you really have to look at texture in a very different way. All right. Now over here on behind me is another plant that I think deserves a lot more use for textural purposes, and that is the genus Carex. Carex are absolutely amazing. They're basically ornamental grasses for shade. Now, not all Carex are shade Carex. Some are sun, but a fair number of them are great. This is a, a Carex albicans. This is a, one of our uh, wild collections in the wild. These grow out in the woods. And if you know which ones you're getting and you're not getting the woody ones, they're fantastic to bring into the garden, but, but really amazing. The best of the, Jap of the variegated ones all come from Japan, and those are great. They behave very well in the gardens. So we talked about smaller ferns. If you look behind me, this is a fern called Dropteris seltza. This is another North Carolina native. So this is a four foot tall fern. So you went from very short to very tall. So you can create so much in a small area simply by having a diversity of plants. Beside that, another great native from um, primarily Japan, some into China. These are the toad lilies. This is the genus Tricertus. There are two groups of toad lilies. There are the summer bloomers and the fall bloomers. Most everybody only knows the fall bloomers. So these will be blooming in September. There's an entire group of them that blooms in July. So they will be blooming shortly. The July ones are primarily yellow flowered whereas the fall ones are primarily purple flowered, but this is about mature size. So here's another curcuma. We looked at one earlier. This is actually this, the very species that turmeric comes from, curcuma longa. If you look on the back of your tags, you'll see uh, curcuma longa. A couple other groups, the group of Solomon seals. Now we have a tremendous amount of native Solomon seals. There's even more Asian. This is one of the Asian European species, uh, uh, Polygonatum latifolium. Solomon seals, again, provide such a wonderful texture. They bloom generally early spring. This, and the blooms are nice. They're all white, pretty much. Well, not all white. There's a few purple and a few orange, but primarily white. But they give you that wonderful ground cover element. And then obviously, Liripe, a plant everyone knows. Sadly, everybody knows the weedy one, which is a species called Liripe spicata, which we would never, ever allow in the garden. But that's the one all your neighbors share because they want to get rid of it. And they're like, look, there's somebody dumb enough that doesn't know what a weed this is, so let me give it to them and let it take over their gardens. We, th we think that plant should be banned. That's just a, a disaster of a plant. This is the clumping. This is Liripe muscari. That one couldn't run under any circumstances. Great plant, and you get the summer flowering. Another great evergreen that we absolutely love are the genus Ruscus. This is a fascinating genus. This is in the asparagus family. So this is, this is first cousin to an asparagus fern. It's rough, it's spiny, you don't want to be grabbing it, but it has these amazing fruit that starting in fall turn bright red, and they're bright red all winter and all spring. So it is the amazing, it's the perfect Christmas plant. It's green and red without have, you having to do any decorating. And it ranges from this particular one, this is Elizabeth Lawrence, uh, named after our famous uh, late garden writer, to one called Wheeler's, which gets up about three and a half to four foot tall. And that, again, is probably one of the absolute finest plants for dark shade. It's almost impossible to get anything any better than that for, for deep shade. It will also take full sun. It prefers shade, however. How tall does Elizabeth get? That's it. That's mature. This is a 20-year-old plant. Wow. Cool. So that's, it's, it's, again, if you like smaller plants, got a place for those, it's perfect. Now, while we're looking at things in the asparagus family, how about an asparagus? 
If you do cut flowers, this is what's sold as filler. This is asparagus virgatus. It is completely hardy to zero degrees, no problems. And it is a woodland plant. Do not put it in the shade. It is one of the finest textural plants for shade that nobody knows about. Absolutely amazing. Can't say enough great things about that. Uh, an, another interesting ground cover. This is, uh, this is the genus Acorus. You can smell a little bit. The roots of this are actually used to make many perfumes. So each form smells a little bit different. They grind them up. But this is an Asian plant. It comes in many forms. This particular one gets about 15 to 18 inches tall. There are some that only get 2 inches tall. They tend to like a little more moisture in terms of habitat. But what an absolutely fantastic uh, group of plants that's, that's almost unknown in, uh, in woodland gardens. So let me turn around and do a few more. I'll probably overrun my time. <laughs> a, a, a native that almost no one knows are Collinsonius. Uh, this is a fantastic and native. You see them uh, primarily up in the mountains. These are getting ready to come into flower. Uh, very small but very open yellow flowers. Uh, many different forms. Uh, Canadense is the most common species. But again, gives you a wonderful textural area, especially if you've got a large area to fill. That's really quite nice. We've also tucked a lot of Alstomerias in here. Alstomerias love this where you've got light open shade, not dense shade. And these flower heavy in spring. They stop during the summer. We actually will come in and cut these to the ground. And then in fall, they'll explode again. So if you do cut flowers, alstomerias are absolutely fantastic in this light shade garden. Not a place you think of putting them. But again, we always look for things that will give us uh, color in the summer garden. So we've got to bring in things from outside of our native area to give us that color. Are amazing. And these do incredible. This is a serum nobilissimum. And the flowers are equally large. So where a typical, where a native of serum, the flowers are this big, the flowers on this one are this big. They're three and a half, four inches across. If, if you've not grown this, to see this flower in your spring garden, it's just like, wow, you want to start posting pictures on social media and call all your friends over for tea. And it's, it's really quite incredible of a plant. Uh, now, a few other odds and ends behind you. This is a pelargonium. Now, most people have grown pelargoniums. They know them under the incorrect name of geraniums. Almost every pelargonium people grow as a house plant, I mean, are, are they called geraniums. But these are actually pelargoniums. This is a South African species that is absolutely winter hardy. And it's, it's a woodland plant. And this will start blooming in September, and this blooms September, October, in the Woodland Garden with typical geranium flowers. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing little plant that, that, again, people don't think of growing. It stays evergreen? No. no, it's deciduous. We found, we've probably got now well over a dozen cycads that are absolutely fine. They are superb woodland plants because they are evergreen through the winter. The only time they go deciduous is if you get temperatures below 15. Then they turn brown for the winter. They're actually not deciduous. And then in spring, just cut the old foliage off and the new foliage comes right back up. So really, you'll see a lot of different uh, uh, types of cycads as you go through today. So we talked about ferns. Now, ferns are all shapes and sizes. So this is a fern. This is called a woodwardia fern. So where the others were small, this thing is massive. So this thing in China grows in waterfalls, and it moves really cool by way of this. So at the end of every leaf, it forms a little fuzzball. And at the end of the year, that fuzzball roots down into the ground, and then it sends another leaf out and another leaf. And so it continues to move or you can relocate them around. Uh, another plant that I think we have really got wrong are boxwoods. Boxwoods are woodland plants. Boxwoods hate growing in the sun. 
The only thing they hate worse is pruners. <laughs> so we're trying to get people to understand. Take your boxwoods, move them all to the woodland garden, throw your pruners away and back away. Boxwoods are very, that has never been touched by a pruner. Boxwoods are incredible. In the middle of winter, your woodland garden will look fabulous if you've got an array of boxwoods in it. Again, no pruning, they don't die. You know, when I used to work plant clinics, every other call was, my boxwoods are dying. Where are they? In full sun. Do you clip them? Yeah, every week. Well, <laughs> here's your sign. There are also so many... Now, let me just back up a minute. Well, I'm talking about boxwoods. Boxwood here, more of an upright. Boxwood over there. So our, our shrub canopy is akubas and boxwoods in the woodland garden. So many people think woodland gardens are just flat and dead in the winter because they don't realize there's all these great woodland shrubs. There's also things like these above me. This is the genus Fatsia. This is first cousin to ivy. Fatsias are incredible. Oh my gosh. Beautiful blooms in late fall. Anything in the ivy family that doesn't run. There's some amazing ivies. Right beside that is another member of the ivy family. This is called Metapanax. It is a woodland evergreen shrub. The ivy family has all these amazing plants, but we, we get so caught up on, oh, I grew English ivy, it took over my garden, I hate everything related to ivy. Well, it's like saying you had a bad cousin, so you hate the rest of your family. It doesn't really make sense. And we even grow ivy itself. The key with ivy is ivy misbehaves when it's young, just like children. Ivy is just like kids. When it turns 15, it goes through horticultural puberty. And it stops running around and it starts having sex. If you go in and root a 15-year-old piece of ivy, it's now a shrub. It's no longer a vine. So it's not that the plant's bad, it's that phase of life just drives us absolutely nuts, just like children. So this is a 20-year-old adult ivy. So it had 15 years to become an adult, and now 20 years of being an adult, and it's absolutely fantastic. So in the woodland garden, it gives you this fantastic shrub effect. So some more of the uh, palms I talked about. These are, again, our native sable miner. But look how great they look. And they look the same in January as they look today. But it's not a plant we think of as growing. It's not a plant you're going to find at the box stores touting, what about these great native palms for your woodland gardens? But they're really incredible. But just sort of look as we walk about how we've tucked things in together and how we've played with textures and forms couple other plants and I'll stop. Uh, we haven't even talked about camellias and azaleas, and they've been all through the gardens, but I figure everybody knows about them. But there are some really amazing camellias and azaleas. This is uh, one of the uh, corkscrew camellias, uh, Subaca, uh, Kujaka Subaca. <laughs> I mean, something like really screwed up camellia. But I love the weeping effect that you get from that. Another Japanese plant that we haven't talked about are the rhodias, or sacred lilies. These are amazing. These are basically evergreen hostas. They come in green, variegated, twisty forms, all kinds of amazing things. They do the same thing a hosta would do in the garden, except they have bright red fruit all winter. Little stalks of bright red fruit, which is amazing, and they are completely evergreen. Uh, also behind us, I did want to talk about these. These are one of the finest woodland plants for texture. These are bamboos. Now, like ivies, people hear the word bamboo and they just go, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, they're clumping bamboos, they're running bamboos. You do not want a running bamboo. Do not plant one. And don't have anybody tell you that it really wasn't bad for the first couple of years they had it. 
because they run underground for three years before they come above ground. They are horrid. Clumping bamboos cannot, cannot run. They could have a pack of hungry pandas chasing them and they couldn't run. This is a 20 year old clump. That, 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 that's mature size. You can get some that are taller, but the majority of them are gonna be in the seven to 10 foot range. Absolutely fantastic. Behind us, clumping bamboo. I think they're absolutely beautiful. I love bamboos. I just can't deal with the running. So again, another option uh, for the woodland garden. A plant, if a lot of you came from up north behind you that you're certainly used to are the ewes, the genus Taxus. Now up north, everybody clips them into an inch of a life making little green meatballs out of them. Put them in the ground, back away from the clippers. Leave them alone. That is a 22 year old dwarf ewe. They love woodland conditions. They love the woodland. They are fantastic woodland plants. Why in the world do we keep using them in the wrong place and have to clip them? Do you have to have certain varieties that will survive our summers? Well, you know, when we, were, when we moved in here, we were told you couldn't grow any ewes in the south. So we started growing every ewe we could found. We've yet to kill one in 35 years. So the books all say they won't grow here. We just haven't found that to be true. Now, they do need good drainage. Don't plant them in, in wet clay. That's not going to work. But we're on sandy loam here, so we have good drainage. and So it's not a heat issue. It's more of poor drainage and heat combined that gives you the problems. Oh, there's just so many things I could keep going. Uh, yes, questions? Are you the author of the Sarcastic Garden? <laughs> we, just, we just like to think of ourselves as myth busters of gardening. <laughs> Give us a good myth, we'll, we'll bust it. Because so much of what you read about writing uh, in gardening is totally incorrect. It has no basis in fact, but it gets repeated enough, it becomes fact. Don't put the funny stuff out. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We, did all the, yeah. we did all the stuff out in the garden. Yes, absolutely. You know, and, and something we hadn't talked about, look at the hanging basket under there. That is an evergreen fern called a tongue fern, the genus Pyrosia. Those baskets stay out all year. So how many evergreen hanging basket ferns can you leave out all winter without fear of them freezing? Not many. Perosias are pretty amazing plants. They'll also grow in the ground, but they need a little bit of a slope, but they absolutely love it. We've got probably 15 different ones scattered all around the gardens. So the opportunities to, to really have fun in a woodland garden, I think are so much greater than a lot of folks realize. It's just, you have to understand the trees, understand the ground, and then understand the plants uh, and which ones love those conditions. Other questions? You didn't mention crinum. I, I didn't mention crinum. Uh, crinums are actually full sun plants. Now, you did see one back there in a fair amount of shade. It's not ideal, but that's part of what we do in experimenting is to see what we can get by with. So, yes, if you are up for crinums that don't flower nearly as well, but have that occasional moment of wow, stick a crinum in there. There's so much that simply has not been tested. So when we get a plant, when we go in the wild and we find a plant growing in dry sun, we bring it back and put it in wet shade. We always do the exact opposite. Because for us, it's not about being successful, it's about learning something we don't know. And so many people in society today are afraid to make mistakes. We've made a society of people who don't want to make mistakes. People used to call up extension. I'm so afraid I'll do this. I'm so afraid. That's how you learn. You know, J.C. Ralston had a great saying. If you're not killing plants, you're not growing as a gardener. <laughs> and that's true. Our, our database right now of every plant we've grown, we have 83,000 entries in there. We have 27,000 plants alive, so we have killed over 50,000 different kinds of plants. And we learn something with every one we kill. That's what I'm sharing with you today. Here's what we've learned. So hopefully you don't have to go out and kill it yourself. Any other questions? I hope you all enjoy the garden. Thank you very much for attending. We'll be around if you have individual questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.